My dearly beloved in Christ, today's gospel selection is taken from the same chapter, chapter 8 of St. Matthew's Gospel, as last Sunday. Last Sunday we had the story of the cure of a leper, and then the story of the centurion who asked our Lord to cure his servant. And that was taken from the first 13 verses of St. Matthew chapter 8. So today, again, is taken from the same chapter, and we find our Lord on a boat going across with his apostles to the other side of the lake. And our Lord is sound asleep on the boat. He was sound asleep because our Lord was utterly fatigued from the constant preaching and curing and traveling, working with people, speaking with people. Our Lord was exhausted. In fact, St. Mark relates the same story of the tempest on the sea and adds an interesting detail. He said that our Lord was sleeping on a cushion or on a pillow in the hinder part of the ship. So our Lord was indeed exhausted. But as one spiritual commentator writes, our Lord was asleep in his human nature, but in his divinity he was awake. And he was fully aware of what was taking place. And as they were rowing or or traveling across the lake, the wind got stronger and stronger. The waves got higher and higher to the point that the apostles, who were very skilled sailors, they were fishermen, they were fearful that the boat would be submerged, that they would drown. And so they woke our Lord and said, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And our Lord admonished them. He said, oh, you of little faith. And then turning to the waves, to the sea, he rebuked the wind and the sea. And immediately there was a great calm. And what particularly strikes me about this gospel is the reaction of the apostles. They had witnessed, again, earlier in the chapter, the story of the cure of a leper the cure of the centurion's son from a distance, and hundreds, thousands perhaps, of other miracles. This took place towards the early part of our Lord's public life, but well enough into his public life that the apostles had witnessed numerous miracles. And their reaction to this one was one of astonishment. They said among themselves, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You could see they were struck by this miracle more than the others that they had witnessed. And of course, the miracles that are the greatest are the interior miracles, the conversions. The apostles, again, had witnessed many cures. But perhaps their astonishment at this taming of of the wild sea in a storm is a reminder that the greater miracles are the interior spiritual miracles of conversion, of all the graces that we receive, the continual interior admonitions. This particular story was foreshadowed in the Old Testament, in the story of Jonas the prophet. Now God had commanded Jonas the prophet to go to a very large city in Syria, Nineveh, and to preach repentance, to rebuke the people for their sinful lives, to tell them that unless they amended, God would punish them. And Jonas was afraid to go there. He thought they would stone him to death. They would not want to hear his message of repentance, and they would kill him. And he was so afraid, he tried to flee, as if you could flee from our Lord. And it says in the book of Jonas, he went down to the city of Joppa and he took sail on a ship. He didn't care where it was going. He was just trying to get away from this uh, commandment of our Lord or duty that he was given to preach to the Ninevites. So he got on the ship and the ship was sailing for a while, maybe a couple days. And he was down in his berth, sound asleep. And the same thing, a a storm arose, and it got worse and worse. The sailors, who were very skilled sailors, were more and more frightened. So they began to throw the goods on the ship overboard to lighten the load. And the captain went down to Jonas 
And he was shocked. He said, how can you sleep in the midst of this storm? Get up and pray to your God. They didn't know he was an Israelite. And um, then the sailors were so scared, it continued, they cast lots to find out who was the cause of this peril. They thought, well, one of their company must be the cause. And the lot fell on Jonas. And they said, who are you? And what are you doing on the ship? And so forth. And he said, well, I I purchased a passage because I'm trying to flee from a commandment that God has given me. And he went on to explain the story to them. And they said, well, then how can we save ourselves from this danger? And he says, well, you have to throw me overboard because I know that I am the cause of your peril. And so that's what they did. He told them to throw him overboard. And as soon as they did, everything was calm. And that's when the whale swallowed up Jonas and he lived inside of a whale for three days. And the whale deposited him then after three days on the shore. And of course, that our Lord himself quoted from that story when they asked him a sign that he was who he claimed to be. And he said, just as Jonas was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. That our Lord arose on the third day from the dead, as just as Jonas seemingly was dead and swallowed up by a whale. So our Lord was asleep on this boat, and the apostles were more and more worried, and they finally awakened him. And our Lord admonished them for their lack of faith as if he would allow the ship to be submerged with himself, the Savior of the world, on board. There are different applications we can make of this story. One of them, of course, would be the boat is symbolic of the church, the bark of Peter. And the church on her course Just as a boat was going across the lake, the church on her course down through history has been buffeted by the storms of persecution and of heresy and of unworthy Catholics. The church has been buffeted and thrown by the waves of all of these persecutions and and heresies and so forth. But it has always weathered the storm. But I would like to make another application of this story, and that is to the individual soul as though our soul individually was the ship. Because we also experienced the storm and the waves of temptations, of trials. And in fact, this is the application that St. Augustine makes of this story. These are his words. The tempest of the waves and winds is the temptation of pride, gluttony, lust, envy, and so on. Let him then, who is beaten by temptation, do what sailors do in a storm. First they furl their sails, that the fury of the wind may not carry the ship away, turn it about, and submerge it. Thus let him who is tempted furl the sails of his pleasures, and give himself up to fasting and penance. Second, sailors make for the open sea, that their ship may not strike against the rocks and the cliffs, at the shore. So let him who is tempted flee from the world and worldly things, and let him have recourse to God as a haven of refuge, and let him say with the psalmist, My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was delighted. Third, sailors cast baggage and merchandise into the sea that they may lighten the ship. So let the tempted unburden themselves by means of contrition and confession of the heavy weight of their sins and thus lighten their minds. Hence the doctors of the church teach that they who are about to go on a sea voyage, especially a long and perilous one, ought to go to confession that they might be sure of being in the state of grace as persons drawing nigh to the point of death not only once only, but in a manifold manner will do. And finally, a good captain, maintaining his courage and having presence of mind, tries every way of avoiding danger. Let the mind of him who is tempted do the same. The man at the helm, says St. Cyprian, is known in a storm. 
just as a soldier is proved in battle. Adversities do not detract from the virtue of faith, but rather confirm it in suffering. How sublime it is to stand amidst to stand erect amidst the ruins of the human race. So we can apply this spiritually to our souls when we endure temptations, when we have spiritual trials, when we have discouragement, spiritual darkness, to take the means of grace available in order to weather the storm. And finally, I would like to go back to that little detail I mentioned that St. Mark mentions in his gospel when he gives this story, how our Lord was sleeping on a pillow. And we know that in the gospels, in Holy Scripture in general, there's no unnecessary word. There is a meaning, there is a purpose to every word. So St. Mark, mentioning that our Lord was asleep with his head on a pillow, what are we to take this pillow as signifying? Mystically, it signifies a good conscience, also resignation to the will of God, and finally, confidence in God's power and providence. So this is the disposition of mind that we ought to have in the midst of trials, to have that great trust in God, that confidence in God, that resignation to his will, and again, turning to him in every difficulty and every need. This reminds me of the words of St. Paul that's actually coming up in a few weeks in the epistle where he was tempted. And he said, three times I prayed to the Lord that the temptation would be taken away. And our Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. That is the the words that St. Paul heard when he was praying to be delivered from temptation. My grace is sufficient for thee. We might go through storms. We might go through perils. But God will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to endure and to overcome, aided by his grace. So these are the lessons we learn from today's gospel. Let us weather the storm with God's help. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.